In this final chapter we turn to the question of how we can realize a quantum computer in practice. For this we have to understand the type of errors that can occur in a quantum computer and identify strategies of how we can mitigate for them. And finally we need to translate this into a set of requirements for physical systems. We start by a discussion of errors on the classical level. So what type of errors can occur in a classical computer? and how we can correct these. And then we translate this to the quantum setting. So we look at quantum error correction. And then we turn to physical systems and look at the so-called De Vincentio criteria which are very general criteria of what is required and expected of a physical system so that it could serve as a platform for quantum computation, as well as for quantum communication. And finally, we have a brief look at possible candidate systems, so possible platforms. So let us start with classical error correction, which will be very useful to fix our notions. First of all, classical computers are built using technologies that are extremely reliable. So this is in particular based on semiconducting structures, where you introduce charge carriers by doping, and so you, for instance, form PN junctions and so forth. And from these, you can build diodes and transistors. And these you can then use to define physical states for your bits. For instance, two different values of a voltage. that you then identify as the states 0 and 1, and these are known as your physical bits. And these physical states turn out to be very reliable because they make use of nonlinearities and dissipation. So this makes these physical states very stable, but it also has some drawbacks. For instance, when you think about the power produced and the heat generated by such a computer. These electronic states might also be volatile, so disappear when you switch off your computer. And therefore, for long-term memory, you could make use of other physical states, such as states of magnetization in different domains on a hard drive. When you then want to process this information, you can do this again most easily using electronic components, such as again diodes and transistors. And these then again are very reliable because they make use of these nonlinearities and dissipation. But nonetheless, errors can occur. For instance, during a computation due to a cosmic neutrino that is sort of changing the voltage states of one of these components, and this indeed can occur, or in communication, something might go wrong. For instance, you might lose a data package. So let us turn to errors and how we can correct for them. First of all, we need to have a good idea what the possible sources of errors are. And this is known as the error model. For instance, we could have bits that change their state unintendedly, and we call these bits flipped. And this we could, for instance, and assume that this can occur independently. For instance, this could occur due to cosmic neutrinos or because the gate doesn't function in the way that it was intended or because we have a magnetic domain on a hard drive that is faulty and when we try to change its state, it doesn't respond in the way intended. 
And when we think about the communication between different components in a computer or between different computers, then it could occur that some of this information just doesn't arrive. So that would be the case of lost data packages. And such packages consist of several bits, so this would be in some way correlated. To mitigate against these errors, we need some additional information somewhere stored in our system, and this is known as redundancy. So this could be, for instance, some information about the number of data packages that have been sent, or some expectations about when they should be arriving. But for illustration, I'm going to focus on this case here, so the case where some of the bits have a wrong value. And in order to recover from this, we need to have this information stored somewhere else in the system. So essentially, we need some additional physical components storing bits that help us to identify these errors and then recover from them. For instance, we could then take a certain number of physical bits. I call this number n and use these to encode a smaller number of so-called logical bits, and this number I call k. The simplest example of this would be to say that one logical bit is encoded in three physical bits, for instance, in this way here. And what this does is to protect us against all errors that only involve one of these bits. For instance, when we start from the logical bit here and apply one of these arrows, so flip one of these bits, then we obtain these three possible states. And when we do the same starting from the other logical bit, then we obtain these three states here. This covers all eight states of these three physical bits, and in particular not more, so there is a unique relation between the states with an error and the states without an error where they arrive from. So in particular, these three states with this error arrived from this state here, and these three states with these errors arrived from this state here. In this case, we can simply divide our states into two groups, depending on the numbers of zeros in the physical bits and whether this is larger than the number of ones or less than the number of ones. This allows us to first detect these errors and then correct for them. The first step, the detection of these errors, is known as syndrome diagnosis. And there we just determine whether all the three physical bits are in the same state or not. And if this isn't the case, then we determine whether there are more physical bits in the state 0 or in the state 1. And then we identify the one physical bit, which is in a different state than the two others, so our error bit. For instance, in the examples above, this would be the third bit or the second bit, or the first bit in these three cases, or here it would be the first, or the second, or the third one. And this is then everything that we need to correct for this error in the so-called recovery operation. where we here simply change the state of the physical bit that is erroneous, so we flip the error bit. And where we then end up with is that our physical system is back to only these two possible states, where all the three physical bits have the same value. And so these are the states that we identify with our logical bits in the state where they don't have any errors. So by carrying out such a syndrome diagnosis and this recovery operation, we can correct for this particular type of error, where we then have encoded one logical bit in three physical bits. 
And the key question is then how many times do we need to carry out these additional operations because we also want to carry out our normal computations and these are certainly interfering. And this is again part of our error model. For instance, we could have a certain rate with which these errors occur for the physical bits. So a certain error rate P. And this would also be the rate that would occur for our logical bits if we would just encode them into individual physical bits, but then we would have no way to detect and recover from these errors. For the example above, for instance, we have to determine how likely it is that we have not just a single, but two errors for two different physical bits. If two consecutive errors occur for the same physical bit, this just cancels, but if it affects two different physical bits, then we fail to identify from which logical bit this arrived from. Assuming that these errors are independent, one can then work out how likely it is that two physical bits within a single logical bit have been flipped, and one arrives at this rate here. And this is indeed then much less than p, when p itself is small. However, this is still not zero, so we still have to carry out these operations, and sometimes we will still have some errors that could just occur in the very next step in our computation, so what we also need to set is a certain tolerance. And all of this together then determines of how many times we have to carry out these error correction steps. In terms of improvement of the error rate, this simple example is already very efficient, but in terms of physical overhead, it certainly isn't, because we have three times as many physical bits as we have logical bits. But this is because we looked at all of these logical bits individually. In the general case, this is much better. There we have n physical bits. And k logical bits. And we can encode these logical bits into the physical bits in many different ways. And the key characteristic of all of these encodings is the following. Say we have two logical bits and the corresponding physical realization. So these physical realizations we interpret as the state of these logical bits without any errors. And then we ask the question of how many physical bits do we need to flip to go from one of these physical realizations to the other. This will be the same into both directions and we call this the distance between L and L prime. So this is defined for any pair of logical bits in this encoding, but then we can ask what is the minimum of this for any of these pairs. And this we call the distance of the code. So these are three important numbers that characterize any code. And we group them into a triple such as this. In here, k and n tell us how efficient this is in terms of physical overhead, and d tells us how many errors we can correct. Because using this code, we can then correct a certain number of errors. So unintended flips of these physical bits, unless this exceeds this number here. So the integer part of the distance of the code minus 1 divided by 2. In the example above, we had three physical bits encoding one logical bit. And it takes us three flips of these bits to go from this state to this state in either direction. So our distance is also 3. And in this case, we can then indeed correct just one error. But the general case includes very efficient strategies, such as the so-called Huffman codes. And as you can imagine, their theory involves, for instance, the Shannon entropy. But we do not need to go into this in any further detail. What we are really interested in is the quantum case. And for this, we have provided enough context and fixed a whole range of useful notions. So we move on to quantum error correction.